Praise the Lord, people of God, and we welcome you to Freedom Fellowship Christian Church's virtual worship experience where we're changing lives through our worship, our witness, and His Word. And so we want to pick up with our sermon series out of the Gospel of Mark. So turn with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 5, and we're going to begin our reading at verse 25. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. So it's Mark chapter 5 verses 25 through 34. This is how it reads. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal for, from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, and so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, 
I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, Who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. When the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him, and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. I want to talk about get your breakthrough. Now, for our virtual audience, you may not be aware of the fact that we just recently had a time of fasting and prayer at the church, and our theme and our prayer focus was breakthrough. So I don't know what area of your life where you need a breakthrough, where you need for God to intervene and to correct some things. And it might be with you internally. It could be with a situation or a set of circumstances that uh, you've been contending with for an extended period of time. Uh, it could be at home. It could be at work. It could be in some other location. I don't know, but I believe all of us stand in need of a breakthrough. We all need God to just step in and change something into work, operate, or function on our behalf. And so that's what we want to talk about on today as we take a look at this woman here in the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. Get your breakthrough. We want to see how she got, how she received her breakthrough. Now, I have to admit to you, when I read the Gospel of Mark, it's one of my favorite Gospels. It's my favorite because it plays out like an action movie. And so when you read about Jesus, he's always uh, on the move and he's always performing miracles and something dynamic and spectacular consistently takes place. Even within Mark, the fifth chapter, I've preached this chapter on several different occasions, and it's because there's so much in it. There's so much excitement. We see the work of God in various people's lives, and we see uh, these people and what they're struggling with, the challenges that they're confronted with, and how Jesus personally, um, how he how he uh, approaches these challenges, how he addresses their need, how he brings about transformation in their life. And so every time I read this, it's just really exciting and it's encouraging, it's motivating, it's inspiring, it inspires hope within me. So when you take a look at Mark chapter 5 and verses 1 through 20, it talks about a demoniac. A demoniac is a person that was possessed by an unclean spirit or by a demonic spirit. Uh, when you read the text, all 20 verses in your personal and private time, you will learn a lot about this nameless character. And that's intentional. He's nameless. We don't know the name of this individual who's suffering from demon possession, but we know he's an unbeliever. How do we know that he's an unbeliever? Because he's possessed by the devil. And we know, I hope you know, that as a believer, you cannot be possessed by the devil. Now, don't become too smug or even arrogant, prideful, and haughty, because although as a believer we can't be possessed by the devil, we can be influenced by him. But we can't be possessed by the devil because we're already possessed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides and lives on the inside of a believer and therefore a demonic presence cannot live on the inside of a believer because that space is already occupied. But the devil and the imps that he has working for him, they can try and influence our behavior and our decision making so that we will do things that uh, dishonor God and disrespect his kingdom and disrespect others. And so that's why it's important for us to yield to the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit who resides on the inside of every 
believer. So we know that he's an unbeliever. We know more than likely this person is a Gentile. The reason being is because the community in which he lives, their primary occupation is to keep swine or pigs. And pigs were distasteful in the Jewish economy. A Jew was not to come in contact with the pig because that pig would then defile them and they would be considered unclean or ceremonially defiled and not allowed to participate in the worship service. And anyone else that they came in contact with would be considered defiled and unclean. So he's nameless. He's possessed by the devil. He's more than likely a Gentile. He's hanging out in places where he shouldn't because this man is alive, but he's living among the dead. Uh, so when you see all of this, uh, it's a life in shambles. It's a life that has been wrecked and uh, the enemy is wreaking havoc in this man's life. Uh, it says that he runs around, uh, is, he's uncontrollable, uh, he's naked, uh, he cries out and he cuts himself. He has suicidal tendencies suffering from self-inflicted wounds. Uh, he's really odd and bizarre. We see all of this uh, in this man's life. But after an encounter with Jesus, we see the same man and he is later seated after he had been running around wild. He's clothed because he was running around wild and naked. And he was in his right mind because before he was acting out of his mind. We see a, a total transformation. This man does a 180 after an encounter with Jesus. And so then after you read beyond verse 20, what we see is Jesus comes in contact with another man. This man, we know his name. His name is Jairus. Not only do we know his name, but we know his occupation because he is the ruler of the synagogue. So it is believed that unlike the previous man who probably lived in poverty since he lived in a cemetery, that this man was rich. He was a prominent uh, man uh, in his community. He was a spiritual man. Uh, he was a worker and a ruler in the synagogue. Uh, we even know this man's name. But he also has a problem in his life. His problem is his family. He has a sick daughter. And so what I love about J. Iris, and I emphasize this as often as possible, is that when he had a problem at home, when he had a problem with his family, when he had a problem with his daughter in particular, that he sought out Jesus. And that serves as a constant reminder to me that when I'm challenged in any way, uh, but when I particularly have a challenge at home, uh, there are times I have to seek Jesus on behalf of my spouse, on the behalf of my children, and now even on the behalf of my grandchildren and our extended family. So he sought out Jesus. He finds Jesus. He makes Jesus aware of his problem at home and he invites Jesus to his home. And isn't that a wonderful thing for this man to invite Jesus to his home? And I just want to ask a question of you today. Have you invited Jesus into your home? Because too often, even if we're faithful church attendees, we leave Jesus at church until we get there the following Sunday. But this man didn't want to leave Jesus at church or in the synagogue. He wanted to take him home. Now, he was a man of tremendous faith in the sense that he sought Jesus to help him out with his problem. But he was also a man of limited faith because he tried to prescribe for Jesus how he was to uh, fulfill or to accomplish and achieve the healing that his daughter needed. He said, I need you to leave where you are. Well, stop what you're doing. Leave where you are. Come to my home. Lay your hands on my daughter. Then I know that she'll recover. But if you ever read in the Gospel of John, there was another father. He was a nobleman who had a sick son, and he made the same request of Jesus. Stop what you're doing. Leave where you are. Come to my home. Heal my sick son. 
And Jesus rebuked him by saying, except you see signs and wonders, you don't believe. Jesus didn't stop what he was doing. He wouldn't leave where he was, but he simply spoke the word from a distance and said, your son is healed. And when the man turned and made his way back home, his servant came running to him and said, your son has been healed. Your son has been delivered. Uh, the nobleman inquired as to what time. And then when he checked the time uh, to what the servant had shared, he then realized it was at the same time time that Jesus said, your son is healed. And so that demonstrated that Jesus has power over distance, that he doesn't have to be where you are in order for him to heal you or to facilitate health and healing or to provide the help that you and I stand in need of. Now, I realize what I said. I said, Jesus doesn't have to be present, but we do understand that God is an omnipresent God, so it's virtually impossible for him not to be present in certain uh, terms. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Jesus didn't stop what he was doing, didn't leave where he was. He has power over distance, and he healed that nobleman's son. But he didn't rebuke Jairus. He was on his way to Jairus' house when this interruption in our text occurs. I know you probably thought I forgot about her, but this is another nameless person. It's a nameless woman who had an issue of blood uh, and she is seeking out Jesus to receive healing and health in her body. And so she stops Jesus, not intentionally, because she was just trying to come up and steal a blessing by touching the hem of his garment. And she wanted to slip off into obscurity but Jesus wouldn't allow for that to happen. But going back to Jairus and his daughter, when this interruption occurred, then Jairus' daughter who was sick died. And so we see Jairus' servant coming to him and he said, you know what? I believe that Jesus could handle a situation of sickness, but this situation has gone from bad to worse. Now she's dead. And so there's no need to trouble the master any further. You know where I'm going with, with this. How many of you already know Jesus has power over death? And so Jesus didn't even listen to that foolishness. He turned to Jairus and in essence said, just keep believing. Don't, don't forsake your faith. Don't doubt me now. Uh, you just keep believing. And then when Jesus made his way to Jairus' house, uh, he did lay his hand on uh, Jairus' daughter, or actually he said, Talitha Kumai, meaning damsel arise. And then when she got up, he grabbed her by the hands. She began to walk around and he said, give her something to eat. And now we're venturing back to the woman with the issue of blood. He said, why are you covering all of this? Because I want us to see this thing together. You could be a nameless man, or you can be a man with a name who's prominent, and rich and wealthy in the community, even a spiritual leader. Or you might not be a man at all. You might be an impoverished woman, a nameless woman. Regardless of your gender, regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of where you live, they have one thing in common. All of them have problems and all of them have issues. And that's what I'm saying. Problems, trials, hardships are equal opportunists. They come to everybody, whether you're black, white, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, uh, it doesn't even matter. Male, female, young or old, problems continuously come in our lives. And so here we have these individuals uh, from different walks of life, but all of them have problems, all of them have challenges, all of them have issues. One of them had money. One of them had some money at one point in time in their life, this woman with an issue of blood, but the text says that she spent all that she had on doctors. And after she exhausted all of her financial resources, the doctors could not facilitate health and healing in her life. And her situation actually went from bad to worse. Jairus had money, but it didn't help his sick daughter. The only one that could help his sick daughter was Jesus. Because money is not the cure-all for our problems. 
And I know society would like for us to think that. Uh, we would think if we can just get a little money, make a little bit more money, if we had money, uh, that it's the cure-all. It'll fix everything in our lives. But that's not true. There's even a modern-day person, I call him a modern-day prophet, that will let you know that. We know him by his nickname, Biggie Smalls. Biggie didn't have any money, was out on the streets hustling for money, eventually became a hip-hop artist and made a lot of money. And after he made a lot of money, he said, in essence, I thought money was going to resolve my problems, but instead what I discovered was this, with more money came more problems. And so I said that to just shift our focus to Jesus, because not only did these individuals have a problem as a similarity, and not only were problems uh, common in their life, but another similarity among their lives was that of an encounter with Jesus. Because after this woman had an encounter with Jesus, Jesus is the one that brought about a change in her life, just like he brought about a change in the life of the demoniac, the man who was once possessed with a demon, but was eventually seated clothed and in his right mind. He also brought about a change in Jairus' life, who had a sick daughter who later died, and he raised that daughter from the dead and then told the family to feed her and give her something to eat. And then this woman with an issue of blood touched the hem of his garment, felt power and virtue come from Jesus and was healed from her infirmity and tried to slip into obscurity. When I read this passage in the King James Version, this is how it read. It said, when she touched the hem of his garment, that the fountain of her blood, a fountain, that means it wasn't trickling, but it was, a, it was like a fountain. It was pouring. The fountain of her blood was dried up. The fountain of her blood speaks of the severity of her problem. This was a severe problem that had gone on for an extended period of time. This woman suffered longer than most of us are willing to suffer. She suffered 12 years. We don't like to suffer for 12 minutes. Nevertheless, 12 days, and sure enough, not 12 months. But for 12 years, she had to deal with this. And it says, the fountain of her blood, the severity of her problem, was met up with the sufficiency of his power, and it was dried up. I think you just missed your shout cue because that is good news, that whenever we can get our problems, our challenges, our issues to the sufficient power of Jesus Christ, that he can effectively and sometimes even immediately deal with those problems to now that problem no longer exists. And so we see that, but once again, it was after her encounter with Jesus. So she had this problem. This problem called her to pursue Jesus. Let us park there for a moment. Have you ever considered that your perpetual pain might be there and in place so that you will pursue Jesus Christ? It's there in order to keep us close to him because if all was well and right with us, we might stray and even uh, neglect or ignore, neglect our relationship with God or ignore God altogether. But it was because of her problem that she pursued him. And sometimes God allows for problems to persist in our life so that we will then persistently be in pursuit of him. And then when she came in contact with him, after having an encounter with many physicians, and finding her situation going from bad to worse, she finally came in contact with the great physician and he sufficiently and adequately kill, he cured her, cured her of her sickness and of her ailment. 
When she tried to slip off into obscurity, he stopped the processional, said, who touched me? The disciples thought he was crazy and said, anybody could have touched you. He said, no, this was a special touch because I perceived that some of my virtue has been drawn from me. And then the woman responded by saying, I'm the one that touched you. But before she even responded, Jesus looked right at her because whenever Jesus asks us a question, he's not seeking information that is currently unavailable to him. He just wants us to come with the confession and testify to what has occurred and what has happened and what we've done. And so once uh, she confessed, he said, daughter, your faith in the King James Version has made you whole. I like the reading of that a little better because I think that what Jesus was teaching her is that I heard your prayers. Internally, you said, if I may touch the hem of your garment, I'll be made whole. Then you passionately pursued me, came in contact with me, touched the hem of my garment, and you received a physical healing, thus a physical blessing. And you were trying to slip off into obscurity. But don't leave until you get what you came for. You didn't just want to be healed physically. You said you wanted to be made whole. Isn't it wonderful to know that the God we serve specializes in wholeness? He wants to make us whole. That means he wants us to be whole and complete, uh, not only physically, but emotionally, uh, mentally, socially, definitely spiritually, even financially. He specializes in making us whole. He said, daughter, isn't that a term of affection? He says, your faith, her acting on the truth of what God has promised has made you whole. Her life was transformed after an encounter with Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that's what Jesus uh, had. That's what he did for her. That's what he's done for me. That's what he can do for you. Make sure that you passionately pursue him. Make sure that you connect with him. Make sure you draw close to him knowing that he'll draw even closer to you. Uh, let's make Jesus a priority and watch him bring about the breakthrough in our lives that we need. Uh, we need his presence. He'll provide us also with his power. He'll even restore our peace when we pursue him. Let the people of God say, man, I thank you for just being a part of this worship experience with us. And we pray that um, you will continue to pray for us. We'll pray for you. We pray that you'll receive the breakthrough, the change, the transformation that you stand in need of, that you desire and that you want for yourself and God most of all wants for you. Uh, we pray that you'll walk out uh, the, the divine plan of God for your life and his divine purpose. Uh, we pray that you will experience wholeness, fulfillment, uh, that sense of being complete, uh, we pray that you will experience what only a relationship with Jesus Christ can provide. And then we also pray that you would uh, continue to faithfully support our ministry by giving, by way of Givelify or mailing your gifts uh, to the P.O. box listed on the screen. Now, if you want to give by way of Givelify, you can download the app. Uh, you can attach your credit or debit card to the app. You can do a search for Freedom Fellowship Christian Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, and then you can prayerfully select the denomination of your gift, and we thank you in advance for your prayerful consideration. Uh, we thank you for always tuning in and for making this ministry possible, and share this with someone else who needs that breakthrough. Help us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we look forward to seeing you on next week.